So for that reason, we're going to go ahead and just concentrate on whatever the Lord has prepared for us to do this morning. And uh, we're going to go ahead and bow our, he our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us to come together as your people for another day of rest, Lord. Not that you're tired, not that you had any reason to rest, but maybe we do, Lord. And you are giving us a spiritual rest from our worries, from our fears, our doubts, our concerns, our, and, and all the other things that distract us from you. And help us, Lord, to be able to enter into a new week that is coming up. And may, be, may it be a blessing unto our family. May you provide all the necessary elements to sustain us. May you always make us grateful and thankful, Lord, for all of the things that you do that we're, we take often for granted. And so we ask forgiveness for that, that failing. And so we want to commit ourselves this morning and ask a special blessing for all of us that are participating in this effort so that we might be able to um, <clears throat> glorify your holy name in a way that is in keeping with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for this day. We ask this in Christ's name, to whom we give all praise, honor, and glory. Amen. The lesson today is on the creation, the six days of creation, creation week, it's commonly called. And uh, we're going to look at that in a particular context. We're going to look at that in creating a world in motion. And what I mean by in motion is I'm um, going to be a little, not the normal motion you're thinking of, but creating things that are already prepared to do and be what they're going to be. And so that's what God does when he creates all of these things is he creates them prepared to be what they're going to be. And that'll make some more sense as, as we go along here. So the, the creation week is going to be the focus of this. And, and we're going to look through those in, in quite a bit of detail as I like to do. And so we're looking for things particularly here that are, are complete, that God has created as complete and ready to move. And that's often going to mean that, um, He's created them in such a way, um, and, but hasn't told us that. And we have to kind of dig in there to look and, and see those kind of things. And, and that'll, as I said, make more sense as we go through it. And so this study is going to dig out those kind of details, and, and hopefully that'll be enjoyable for everyone. Um, I'm sure we've all been through the Genesis Creation Week many times, and uh, we want to dig a little deeper this time. And as for this study, uh, the future of this, I, I may or may not go into Genesis chapter 2. We'll have to see exactly what we're going to do um, in the coming week, but we'll see, we'll see where that goes when, it, when time comes. So that's our focus. But you can't start the Genesis week with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. You really need to start uh, with John, um, what happens before creation, because John, in the first verses of John, talks about that what has happened at creation and what was just a bit before creation. And so that's where we want to look at is what happened before creation. And so this comes from John. I see that I forgot to put a, a quote on it, um, but it's coming from John chapter one, um, verses one through three. Um, in the origin, the word had been existing and that word had been existing with God. And that word was himself God. This one himself was at the origin with God. Everything was in his hand, and without him, not even one thing existed of the things that exist. So you can see he starts out in the origin, um, and he could have also been translated uh, in, at, in the beginning. It means the same thing. He's using the same word, Bereshit, um, Hebrew and Aramaic, it's the same thing. And, and so he's really reflecting that idea that he's speaking about creation uh, week and, and Genesis and what happens in there. And so he's talking about what happened just before that. And he says, um, God was there, the word, the son of God, whatever you want to call him. Um, and and uh, what was the person who did that creation? He created everything that exists. And before that, there was nothing that existed. Nothing except God, of course. Uh, God existed. And so we'll just pause and think about that a little bit. When he says that nothing existed, we understand that God is spirit and a God was all that there was. There wasn't anything else. There wasn't an up or a down. There wasn't any dimensionality. There wasn't a, a before or an after. There wasn't any time. There wasn't any space. There wasn't any universe. There was nothing except God. And, and that's all there was. And it's hard for us to imagine that. Um, in, in our lives, we always have something around us. 
and and in this physical realm that we live in. But it wasn't like that for God. Um, he was all that there was, and he was completely content to be all that there was. But he decided that he would begin creation and, and do this whole creation thing, that he might be glorified through it. And, and that was his reasoning. So um, before creation, there was absolutely nothing of what we know. Um, no universe, no time, nothing at all. And, um, and Jesus, well, we know him as Jesus now, but um, back at that time, Jesus hadn't been born. He was probably called son of God or whatever. The word is what John refers to him as. He was the one who created everything. And, and it was through him that everything was created. But he did that according to the father's will. The father was the one who planned it, that we understand. And, and, um, and the son of God, Jesus was the one who actually brought it into existence. And so it's kind of important to understand what, a little bit what happened uh, before those moments of creation. But you can't really even say the word before creation because there was no time before creation. The whole concept of time vanishes before creation. Um, so it, it's a little hard to speak of that. But at that time, at, at that moment of creation, um, God was there and God was all that was there. There wasn't anything other than that. So now with that background, we can move into Genesis chapter one. And um, I'll read that one. In the beginning, so there you see what John was saying, the same thing. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was in chaos and vacant. Darkness was over the surface of the abyss and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness or obscurity he called night. And it became evening and it became morning, day one. So that was the first day of creation. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things I want to pick out here. And, and one is I've made some notes in, in here uh, and, um, and some comments in here. You can see that the word heaven, I put an um, S in parenthesis after that. The word for heaven is um, a word um, that can be singular or plural at the same, um, either one of those. And, and there are a number of words in Hebrew. That's a fairly common thing. We, we have a few words in English that are like that. One of them is the word series. Series, is like a baseball series, that kind of a series. So um, the word series, it can be singular. We can talk about one series. Or if there's a bunch of series, we still call them series. We use the same word and it ends in S. And so it looks like it's a plural because it ends in an S, but it's not. There is no word Siri without that S. So it's kind of similar here. Um, this, this word that is in the Hebrew for heavens can be a singular or it can be a plural. And, and that actually tells us something about what he created. When he created the heavens, he created the plurality of things. Up until that time, there was no heaven. There, there, was, there were no angels. There was nothing. And so in creating the heavens, that part of it, he is creating all of those things, the angels, angelic realm, all of those things are created at the same time. And he also creates the earth. So um, that word heavens, keep that in mind when you see that, because it appears in other places too, um, is a word that describes multiple things. And the Bible describes three distinct heavens. Um, and, and we'll see them actually as we go through the creation week here. Um, the, the first heaven, as we think of it, is the atmosphere, uh, and we'll see that as part of creation week here, is that the atmosphere uh, that we live in is called a heaven. And um, outside of that, the next step is the planets and stars and all that stuff. That area up there is another heaven. And so that's um, a heaven outside of the atmosphere of the earth. And then there's another heaven after that, which is the heaven of God and the angels and all that stuff. And that's a, a different place as well. And so those three heavens, the Bible refers to. And, uh, and specifically, um, uh, there's a reference in the New Testament to particularly the third heaven. And Paul talks about um, a vision that he had where he went to the third heaven. So keep that in mind um, always when you're understanding the Bible and when he talks about heavens. Um, it often refers to a singular heaven, and sometimes it refers to a plurality of heavens. And, and that's important to keep it straight and understand what's going on when, the, when you see those kinds of references. Okay, another thing that we see in there is this idea of the Spirit of God and hovering over the surface of the abyss and um, hovering over the waters. And um, a lot of people have tried to understand that. Uh, what does it exactly mean that he was hovering over the waters? 
Some translate the word as vibrate, other things like that. And I have no understanding of that. Um, it's a mystery to me as well. Um, I've seen lots of people's interpretations of it, but none of them really seem to fit quite right. And so that's a mystery. Okay, now God creates light here. Um, he creates light out of what was previously darkness. When he, when he first created the earth and, and the universe, and of course time and dimension and all those things that are part of the universe, um, it is dark. There is no light. And, and it actually says that in the verse. It says darkness was over the surface of the, of the abyss. Uh, and so there was nothing but darkness. And out of that darkness, God um, creates light. But we don't know where the light is coming from. And it doesn't say there. Uh, we know that there is no sun because that isn't created for a few days yet. Um, and so it's not coming from there. Um, and so we're not really sure. There's a lot of different theories about where this light is coming from. Uh, some people say that the light was just everywhere. There was um, light from all directions. Um, and, but other people say, well, maybe the light was coming from some particular direction. And then other people again think of, well, maybe it was coming from just a particular point in space. And, and maybe even later on that point in space became the sun. Um, there are lots of different ideas about this, but the Bible simply doesn't say. But it, it's good to understand that there is light and there aren't any light sources at that point in time. Uh, those will be created uh, a few days later on. And so that makes us wonder a little bit about exactly what evening and night is, because it says it became evening and it became morning. And, and so um, we have to wonder a little bit about exactly what an evening is, because we're so used to an evening and a night um, being something that we've lived with all of our lives. Maybe it doesn't mean exactly that same thing here. And, and, and so that kind of brings us to another question here is how long is a day? And, and so we assume that the earth is turning um, when God created it. And so this is part of our uh, creation in motion idea is that when God creates the earth, he doesn't just create the earth, he creates the earth spinning and the spin rate is one rotation per day. And so we, we understand that a day in our lives is defined by sunset and sunrise, but God was the one who in advance had decided what the earth's spin rate was going to be. And he set that down when he created earth and, and it spun at the rate that he wanted it to be. So it is God who defines the day, not the earth who defines the day and its duration. And, and so when it says it became evening and it became morning, that might mean something more like um, it, it, the, the day came to an end and the next day began, um, something like that. And, and in a universe full of light when you, when you couldn't have the darkening at that time. And, and one thing also that you see in here is it talks about um, separating the light. And this idea of separating is, is gonna be something we see all through creation week. God will be separating one thing from another. And in this case, he separates light such that there can be light and darkness. And, and, um, and so he could have created light so that it would be everywhere all the time and, and there wouldn't be any darkness. Um, but he didn't do that. He, he still wanted darkness. Remember, everything started in darkness and then he created light on top of that. But he didn't want light to wipe out darkness. He, he created light so that there could be both light and darkness. And in our world, our science-driven world, we understand that light is made out of photons. And, and these photons um, don't go through things. Um, certainly the visible light spectrum uh, don't go through all things and they cast a shadow. And, and that's really what God did here is he, he separated light so that it could still be darkness uh, where there wasn't light. And, and um, there's kind of an interesting reference in Revelation where things are not that way. In the new earth and, and, and the new universe that is created, um, I shouldn't say universe, um, in the new earth, uh, God will be the light or Jesus will be the light. And that light will be a penetrating light that is everywhere, un unlike the light that we experience. And, and it talks about that um, in Revelation uh, that time. So that would be a light that goes through walls and goes through things, unlike the light that we experience in our lives. And so um, God here, though, separates those and, and causes light to be something that doesn't go through, visible light anyway, doesn't go through matter. And so if there can be darkness that we see. So there's some couple of ideas to think about there that you may not have thought about, about this creation day. Um, one more thing I want to bring up is the idea here that it says day one. All the other creation days, it's going to say uh, second or third or fourth. But this time it says day one. 
And, and the scholars in Hebrew say that this is done for a particular reason. It's done to emphasize the fact that these are literal days. They are not periods of time. And, and I expect that God did that because he knew that there would be a time here in our lives where people would say, well, maybe those days were actually billions of years or something, and, and creation really happened over a longer period of time. Um, and and the, the scholars in this say that, no, this, this reference here to day one in this place and then second day, third day for all the others is making it clear that we're talking about literal days, not, not anything else, not periods of, of time. Because we can do that ourselves, even in English, we can say, in my day, when I was young, um, that sort of thing. And, and so we can talk about a day as a period of time. But this is written intentionally to, to make it clear that we're talking about one day, literal days of, of time and, and nothing else. And, and um, the, the historians also say that, that all of this is also written to make it clear that this is literal. It isn't meant to be a symbolic representation of anything. It isn't meant to be uh, interpreted as uh, like um, Psalms or Proverbs. It isn't uh, um, um, something like that. It is intended to be literal. And, and there is no doubt about it, that it is literal days that we're talking about. Let's so that's it up for something there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, uh, I was kind of um, taking a little bit aback about the, the light because the, that's referred to here because it hadn't occurred to me that there was no sun yet, you know, and, but that's obviously the, the truth there. And so I started thinking more about this light. Where was it coming from? Now, I remember Revelations, um, <clears throat> Revelations 21 verse 23 and 24, and it talks about the, the, the new Jerusalem, you know, that is going to be where the kingdom is being set, the literal kingdom is, that will be on earth. It says the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, we don't know for sure, but it's more than likely that light is coming from God, just like it will in the future. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that is a different kind of light at that time. Uh, that's not the, the photon light that we experience now. We're talking about a light that comes from glory, uh, something we can't understand in, in our bodies at this time. Um, but we will at that time, of course. Okay, I want to make one more uh, uh, note here uh, that you might not have thought about from the day one creation. Um, when God creates the earth, um, as I've been talking about here, um, we're talking about he's creating an, an earth that is ready for its purposes. And so he's created um, an earth that is covered by water, but down underneath the water, there is uh, land. And, and we're going to see that land pop up right away here in the creation days. Um, but even more than that, um, the water is fresh. It's not salty water that he's created. It, it's uh, water that isn't uh, got any salt in it at all. So, um, and, and we know right now that the, the salt seas are, are very salty, um, but the rivers aren't because uh, when the, the cycle of, of evaporation of seawater uh, happens, it leaves the salt behind. And that means that um, the fresh, the, the Evaporated water goes up, becomes clouds, rains, uh, comes down on us, and it carries salt from the land into the sea. And that's why the sea becomes saltier over time. And, and it is, even to this day, um, the, the sea becomes saltier and saltier over time. Now, in very small amounts, um, but given enough time, uh, eventually the sea would um, become extremely salty and, and intolerable. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Israel and been to the Dead Sea. That's the saltiest body of water there is, and it is really salty. Um, you go in that only for the experience, not for the sake of uh, doing anything like swimming, because you wouldn't want to get any of that salt water anywhere in your eyes, mouth, anything, because it is horribly salty. And and um, and that was that is what um, the seas will eventually become. They'll become um, a place that is so salty that uh, fish can't live there and people can't tolerate it, given enough time. Um, and, and of course, that would be many thousands of years yet. Um, 
but but so that leads us this idea that the sea is getting saltier as we go leads us to the idea that it previously wasn't salty uh, if you go back far enough there was a time when it wasn't salty and um and that'll make a little more sense when we see uh noah's flood is that what happened is the the flood covers the entire word earth and so if there had been fish that couldn't tolerate uh um salt um then that would have been a problem for them um, but that isn't the case. At, at the time of Noah's flood, the oceans are still fresh or, or pretty close to fresh. Um, and, and so that's something you might not have thought of as well. So uh, we'll pause here after day one. Who has any comments or thoughts, uh, questions that you want to ask about this? Or maybe things that you've noticed and, and want yeah. to bring up? So it says, it became evening and it became morning, day one. Does, yep. does that mean that a day really starts in the evening? I mean, according to the Bible, does does a day really start in the evening? Or, or is that just the way they decide? I mean, does that really mean anything? Yes, it does. Really good question. Um, and it, the English translations do it this way. But if you understand Hebrew, I'm told, and I don't understand Hebrew, I just know a few words, um, that this should probably be read as... Um, uh, the, it, it became the end of the day and it, and it became morning and that becoming makes day one. So at, at the beginning of the evening is when the day ends. Um, so it, it's an awkward thing in English, but apparently it makes more sense in Hebrew. And so the day actually ends with the uh, coming of evening and, and that coming of evening is followed by a morning and that uh, begins the new day. So, yes, um, this is the first indication that, that um, God's day uh, ends with evening. Good point. Any other questions or comments there? Okay, I'll move on. We're not done with day one yet. Um, I want to talk about some other things. One is the Big Bang. Um, which is science's current theory. Um, and already we can see that, that creation week is out of alignment with the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is that um, suddenly a whole bunch of hot particles, or not even par particles, just energy, uh, appeared uh, out of nowhere and uh, created a universe. And eventually though, that energy coalesced down into particles and, and eventually into electrons and protons and things like that, and eventually the atoms, and then, then those atoms somehow became uh, galactic uh, clusters, and then there were uh, just galaxies that formed out of that, and then out of those came stars, then out of those stars came planets like Earth. And, and so right out of the gate, we are misaligned with the Big Bang Theory. Um, it just doesn't match up with that. And, and you might as well get used to that. Uh, the Big Bang Theory is not a, a biblical theory at all. There's a lot of people who try and stretch the, the, the days in Genesis to say that, yes, they do line up, but the order of things is all wrong. It's not at all what the Big Bang sa says. And we shouldn't worry about that. Um, if you, um, I don't know if you follow this kind of stuff, but if you, if you do a web search uh, or even a YouTube search on crisis in cosmology, you'll find a lot of talk right now about a big problem that cosmology is having. And the problem that they're having is that the Big Bang made a lot of predictions uh, about what the universe was like and, and would be like because of uh, that Big Bang creation existence idea. And at the time that that Big Bang theory came out, there was no way to check a lot of those predictions to see if they were true. But now we are able to, to check a lot of those predictions and a lot of them are wrong and not just wrong by a little bit, but they're not even close to right. And so this crisis in cosmology that scientists are talking about right now is this really big problem that the Big Bang Theory doesn't line up with the universe and, 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 and in significant ways, important ways. And of course, there are still some people who are trying to hold on to the Big Bang and, and, uh, and get it to somehow work in some way as people would cling on to things like that. But there really is no working theory about how the universe came into existence right now. There's no agreement on the Big Bang idea because it's been discredited by this. And, and so they don't have a working theory about how the universe came into existence. And there's a similar crisis going on in evolution. And, and this kind of, I suppose it doesn't really surprise me. I, I wonder if God hasn't intended for things to fall apart at this time. Because at the same time, 
we're having a crisis with the whole evolution idea, which is a similar idea to Big Bang, but it's instead on plants and animals rather than the cosmos. So Darwinian evolution, when it first started, um, was a theory about almost magical things happening uh, in, in the birth process, um, changes that, that we now realize weren't possible. And as soon as Francis and Crick, if you probably don't know those names, they're the people who discovered the structure, the, the helical structure of DNA. And um, with that, uh, people very quickly understood how re reproduction happened and how uh, a lot of things uh, happened in, in the body. And the result of that was they realized that uh, Darwinian evolution had a bunch of wrong predictions. It, it just wasn't right in a lot of things that Darwin thought might have been possible for evolution. Um, the DNA simply wouldn't support that. And so without anybody really telling you, Darwinian evolution died back then. That was back in the 1950s or so. And, um, and it was modified um, to take out the things that Darwin said would happen in evolution that couldn't possibly happen. Well, now in modern evolution, um, they've discovered even more things about how DNA works and, and assembles things and, and how pieces are, are made. And, and they now understand that random chance simply cannot produce um, the things that have been produced. Um, and, and that's been the core to the Darwinian idea is that um, random chance causes genetic changes and those genetic changes res result in new, better features. Um, but what scientists have found now is that the whole thing is so intricate that it couldn't have possibly happened by chance. And, and any chance events that do happen uh, to DNA and cause DNA changes cause destruction. They never cause anything to be better. They just wreck what's there. And, and so, um, Here's another good point. Um, back in creation, um, the, the Adam and Eve didn't have all of the diseases that we had. All of those have come from things that have, have happened in the decay coming after the flood. And so all of the cancers and things like that, they never knew any of those sort of things because they are the result of genetic failings um, that have happened in the DNA since. So um, when changes happen to DNA, they're mistakes. They're, they're not ever making anything better. And so modern ev evolution has been rejected by most scientists. Of course, like I said, with uh, the Big Bang Theory, there are still some clinging on to it. But the people who really do the math and, and uh, the deep understanding say that it just can't work. Um, probability makes it impossible. And so uh, they also have no working theory for how man came about and evolved and how life happened. So we have kind of these two major theories at the same time having no working theory left for them. And, and I think that's kind of interesting. And, I'll, and I have one quote here from Second Corinthians that I thought was interesting. Um, it refers back to this event in creation. It says, for God who spoke that light would shine out of darkness. So it, that's referring to God saying, let there be light. And there was light where there had previously been nothing but darkness. And, and the earth had been in nothing but darkness. And there was light because he had said that. So any questions there? Uh, I no, can say I is that back at a winter tree back then, almost 10 years ago or so, I remember the time when they were actually talking about evolution back then. And I remember, long story short, so is this question. Yeah. If, there are, if evolution is true, then why are the bunch of apes and monkeys uh, over at the zoos themselves all caving and everything? This goes to show that evolution does like that doesn't always work. Yeah, no, it's certainly true. Um, evolution has other problems. They've kind of painted over some of them, but this one is, is really big. This one is, it can't happen. Um, Pastor Joe, you had a question? Uh, no, I, I had a, uh, every time I run into somebody that believes in the Big Bang Theory, which is basically, in essence, one large mass that was out there that exploded for different reasons, that some of which you mentioned as possibilities, is it exploded and turned into a bunch of perfect planets and worlds and everything else. But when you ask them the question, where did that big mass come from in the first place? They cannot answer that. See, that, that's our big problem. Yeah. The biggest problem, I think, is when it exploded, how, how does a, a planet like the Earth uh, <clears throat> create uh, you know, a, an existence and life that is so perfect and profound? It, it's more complex than the most... Um, you know, intricate computer that's out there. And it, I think you need a lot of faith you to do. believe in that sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, There's that actually, 
That brings yeah. up another argument that I'll, I wasn't going to go into, but I'll just hit on briefly. It, it's called the problem with the fineness of the universe. And, and what happened is <clears throat> scientists um, decided to determine what were the, the basic constants of the whole universe. What, what are the things that are very foundational, fundamental, um, the most basic elements of the universe? Mm -hmm. And they identified, I think it's six, maybe it's seven constants that are, are the foundational constants for the universe. And, the, and, and these things, these constants don't seem to come from any place else. They just seem to be um, something that is part of the, the universe. And I, I won't go into any of what they are, but the problem with these constants, once they had defined them, they discovered that they are extremely sensitive to the smallest change. If those constants make the tiniest little change, then that destroys the universe in one way or another and, and uh, precludes life in, in all cases. And so the problem that science is having with that is how on earth did we get into a universe that is so finely tuned that it would produce life? And, and this, this fine tuning of constants is a problem for science because it, it seems like it's not random. It seems like something intentional happened. And so scientists have been coming up with all sorts of ideas, like the, the multiverse idea, if you've ever, ever heard of that. And so the, the proposition there is that there are, in fact, gazillions of universes, and, and we are in this universe because it's the only one that could, survive, could uh, support life, and all the others have different constants that can't so, support life. So that's making it up. There is no evidence to support an idea like that. But yeah, there are a number of problems in, in the sciences having to do with these things and, and the ideas that uh, they're trying to put together that work around God and don't have any sort of God basis in them. But yeah, we'll, we'll move on from there. We won't go into that too much. Okay, so the second day. And God said, let there be atmosphere between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the atmosphere and separated the water under the atmosphere from the water above it. And it was so. God called the atmosphere heavens. There's that heavens word again. And it became evening and it became morning. Second day. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of things to, to talk about here. Um, separating uh, again happens. We saw separating uh, light and darkness in the first day. Here we see separating water uh, from water. And, and what happens here is um, God raises up a layer of the water up into the air and creates air, atmosphere, in between those two layers of water. Now, a, a lot of scientists have a problem with that idea that there was actually a layer of water at some point above the Earth. Um, maybe it became ice once it was up there, who knows what form it was in. Um, the Bible certainly doesn't talk about that. But it, the Bible makes it very clear that, that God took a layer of water, raised it up, and created air in between the, that, the water above and the water below. And some people have tried to say, well, he actually means clouds. Well, no, the, the author of this knew what a cloud was, and, and it's not the same thing as a cloud. Plus, clouds travel within the atmosphere. They aren't on the outer side of, of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not between the water on the ground and, and the clouds. The clouds are part of the atmosphere. So that doesn't make any sense. And so um, what's, what's happened here is, is something quite interesting. And I think it impacts on Noah and what happened with Noah. Remember, during the flood, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights really hard all across the entire surface of the Earth. And so that's a whole lot of water. And so this uh, creation event is putting a whole lot of water in the air for that purpose. It, it's going to be the water that's going to come down uh, from above. Uh, the gates of, of the heavens are going to let loose and, and all of this water is going to come down. So this is kind of preparing us a little bit for what's going to happen with Noah when that happens. And again, we see the word heavens used here. And uh, it says, um, um, God called the atmosphere heavens. So in this case, that word is a singular. He's talking about the heaven of atmosphere or air that, that is or was between those two layers of water that he created. And uh, this is second day. Remember I said before, the first day is called day one. This one is called second day, and we'll see that the next one is called third day. So they're, they're different in the naming intentionally to make it, us understand that um, we're talking about literal days here. So any questions or comments on that? That's probably new to some people. Okay, if not, we'll move on. Okay, uh, third day. And God said, let the water under the heavens be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered water he called seas. 
And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Okay, a number of things, and I emphasized it. Oh, I left off that verse. And it became evening, and it became morning, third day. Um, so uh, I emphasized the water under the heavens. So he's talking about um, the water that is still on the ground um, over the surface of the earth that we know is below it, but so far that earth, earth hasn't surfaced. And um, so he's, he's talking about that water below um, the atmosphere is what's going to be separated. And what happens is he pulls that water into one place to reveal and push up the land. And, and so uh, this is a separation again, where he's separating water from the land. And the land had always been below the surface of the water. And, and now by, by pulling the water back, um, he reveals the land, which is pushed up um, by the forces of gravity, I guess, and, and becomes land. And, and God uh, uh, makes it dry land. And, and he says the dry ground is called land. And, and so um, it creates one big chunk of land. And uh, right now we don't see that. We have a whole bunch of continents. And, and if you've ever heard of Pangaea, um, it's possible. Pangaea is the idea that all of these continents were once all part of the same landmass. And if you look at a map, you can actually see that all of these continents fit together like puzzle pieces. If you, uh, and you can kind of run their path back and fit them into a single landmass. And that's the idea of Pangaea. People long ago discovered that uh, once they can see that all these, the shapes of all these continents, they discovered that they would all fit together into a single landmass. And they called that Pangaea. So what God says here is, yes, that's what I created. I pulled back the water and there was one landmass that was the result of that. And what happens during the flood, again, we're going to talk about the flood here, is that one landmass is shattered. And, and all of those uh, shattered pieces, which we call continents now, all go zooming apart, uh, forced apart by the cataclysms that are going on as a result of what's happening on the earth with all the water on it. And, and so again, we kind of see uh, Noah's flood coming in here as something that's going to change what God created. Remember that Noah's flood was essentially a destruction of what he had created and, and wiping the slate clean on the earth. And, and wiping out everything that mankind had done. And, and so everything was destroyed at that time. Um, let's see, uh, I said already that he separated water from land um, and he also separates kinds. Uh, so he's, he creates species of plants. Uh, species is the word that we would use now. And, and he separates those into seeds and he determines something that we take for granted. He determines that a seed from an apple tree, for example, will grow another apple tree. And, and we just grow up understanding that. We don't think about that. But he could have created seeds such that a seed from an apple tree might be an orange tree or it might be a, a pineapple bush or it might be something else, who knows what. But instead, God determined that um, a seed from a tree will reproduce to create another tree of that same kind. And so this idea of kinds, we're going to see again through the creation days. We're going to see kinds of animals and, and things like that. And um, this idea of kinds, we, which I said we call species in our time, um, is in God's um, definition, something that is, it seems to be a line that can't be crossed. And, and that's part of the theory of evolution's problem is that it, it tries to believe that you can cross between kinds. And, and so a kind is like, a dog kind or a horse kind, that sort of thing. And within, for example, a horse kind, you've got zebras and all sorts of other different kinds of horses that are all part of a horse. We all recognize those as a horse, but there's no way that a, that a zebra can ever give birth to a dog um, or a dog to a zebra. You can't cross those boundaries that God has set up there. And, and so as it is true with the, the seed bearing plants here that, that a tree um, will reproduce in its own kind, um, the same thing is true with um, all of the other animals and things that we'll see in the later creation days. And so kinds is sort of like our word species, but even in, uh, in science, the word species isn't clear to a lot of people. And they sometimes include things that aren't part of a species because it seems to make sense to them. But um, we won't go into there. Um, so what God has set up here is the idea that there is going to be seed and reproduction and this is where the whole genetic system is created 
And, and remember that plants have the same DNA that we do. They just use it in different ways. And, and so God creates genetics at the same time. And, and so he's produced more than the verse says. Um, the, bird just, the verse just says seeds, but we now understand how seeds work and how genetics work and, and those sort of things. And we understand what God said is true, that, that an apple tree produces apple trees and, and that's all it reproduce or all it produces when it reproduces. So any questions on that? Um, I have a question, Stan. Sure. Um, on, on the verse, like verse 13, where it says, it became evening and it became morning the third day. Um, when you were explaining earlier, I was a little confused. Are you saying that the biblical day does not begin at sunset? No, no, exactly the opposite of that. Okay. Um, we, in, in English, you can look at this and think that, but that's the wrong way to understand it. Um, I, I'm told that in the Hebrew, when you understand it from the Hebrew, it's, it's definitely saying the day ends with the evening and the evening is followed by the morning. And, and, and so the third day actually ends. We would write the English sentence um, as uh, from putting the third day at the start. And we would say it was the third day. That was the end of the third day and it became evening and it became morning. But in Hebrew, they, they write it differently. And, and when that's translated directly into English, it looks wrong to us. But yes, the, the day ends with evening. You don't believe that the day begins with sunset? Well, yes. Well, this is only talking about end of the day. And so the next day begins with the end of the day. Okay. So when you celebrate the Sabbath, for example, you, you start at sundown on Friday, correct? Yes. Okay. I just, yeah. I just wanted, it was a little confusing to me. Yeah, no, I, I didn't mean to imply anything like that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, I wasn't clear. And it, it's a hard thing to understand because when you look at this in English, it sounds like morning is the beginning of a day, but that's not what the verse is really saying. Um, right. it's, it's just saying um, it was the end of the day, it end, ended with evening, and then there was morning. Um, so yeah, the day ends um, with, with the evening, and uh, the next one begins at that time. Okay, thank I think you. What's, what's been a little confusing is that um, as, as, as it gets closer to winter time, the days are shorter. Uh, like right now, it, it seems like the sun goes down before 6 o'clock. And because um, like I, I have uh, pets that I have to feed <clears throat> before it gets dark. And they don't care what time it is. They, they, they look at the sun. And when it's starting to go down, they start whining for their food. And, and even though I've been feeding them after, after 7 or closer to 8 sometimes, it, all they care about is, is, is uh, when the sun goes down, you know? <clears throat> so it's a little confusing for us as people, but not, not for, the, for um, animals, in really. So it is kind of a strange situation because how about like in, in Alaska or the North Pole, their days are, are probably like, what, six hours or less, you know? Well, yeah, it, um, their days actually become all night. Uh, at, at the very top of the earth or bottom of the earth and and um <laughs> their the nights become all day um kind of confusing they, they do get to a point where they have 24-hour days and 24-hour nights on the other side of the, the year uh, but yeah it, it's kind of an inter interesting point about daylight savings time we as humans go through that same transition it's it's hard for us to get used to getting up later or getting up earlier and we have to take some time to adapt to that. And, and I, my animals, my cats, uh, have to get uh, used to that because I'm not going to get up according to their schedule. <laughs> they're they're going to learn to adapt just like I have to. <laughs> good, so good any other questions? <clears throat> no, I just said good luck with that. No, uh, we do <laughs> <laughs> They get used to it. OK. Um, I think that's good enough for today, and we will pick this up next week, and we'll finish off Creation Week. Yeah, we still got four days to go there. Yeah.